I want to begin by thanking uh, the chairperson and executive secretary of the Transparency International Colombo Office for inviting me to deliver this keynote address on this special occasion of the 20th, 20th anniversary of the TIS founding in Colombo. It was so nice to listen to Sarah, one of the founder members of the <coughs> Transparency International Office in Colombo, about the background against which it was set up in Colombo, and as well as some information about its founding pro pro event itself. <coughs> so the topic I have uh, selected for my presentation is fighting corruption in a decayed democracy, thinking the unthinkable. So <laughs> what I'm going to do, basically to make my presentation in English. Earlier I was planning to speak in Sinhala as well, but I understand that there is simultaneous translation of the proceedings into Sinhalese as well as Tamil. Unless there is a request for me to speak in Sinhala as well, I will focus primarily on speaking in English. So in this uh, presentation, I have organized my reflections under three themes. One, the nature of the problem of ending corruption in Sri Lanka. It's a problem. I want to later on discuss why it is a problem. The second theme is political and social consequences of corruption in Sri Lanka. Thirdly, challenges to eradicate corruption specific to Sri Lanka. Of course, there's a fourth theme as well. There's the way forward, perhaps a possible way forward for combating corruption. So the rise of political and bureaucratic corruption in post-colonial Sri Lanka has interestingly coincided with democratic backsliding and de-democratization as well. That's where we can see the link between corruption and political process. It has also been both a cause and consequence of the decay of our political institutions, democratic political culture, as well as the ethical life of the political community. I'm so happy to see the name of International Republican Institution here because fighting against corruption is a Republican normative goal and a corruption-free public life is essentially a Republican normative value. The negative, sorry, the negative impact of corruption in our society and the political life is so pervasive that, to use a cliche, it's a cancer in the body politic eating into its vital organs. Therefore, fighting corruption in Sri Lanka has become closely intertwined with the struggle for democratization. That's my main theme in the presentation. How to combat corruption? This has been a public concern as well as a political slogan in the early 1990s. We all will remember that slogan against Bishane and against Dushane in 1994. As a political slogan, by, by now, fighting against corruption has totally lost its credibility. But as a public concern, it has assumed a renewed significance. <coughs> Two of the key slogans of the recent Citizens Aragalaya, I'm glad that number of you mentioned about the Aragalaya. Uh, you know, it's a term that I think being not only <coughs> trivialized, but also demonized these days. So in the recent <laughs> Aragalaya, there was a systemic, systemic change and a new political culture that were the key slogans that emerged in Aragalaya. They encapsulated Sri Lanka citizens' continuing desire for seeing a normatively and ethically clean political life. I think that's one of the most important messages that the citizens in Sri Lanka 
delivered very loudly during uh, April, uh, the four months from April to July, and it continues there. Almost all, at, all attempts made in Sri Lanka to eradicate corruption by legal and institutional means, as well as by political propaganda, have won, also have an uninterrupted record of failures with occasional successes. The task at present is about thinking the impossible while not giving up the hope that our citizens, rather than the political class, will continue to spearhead the struggle for a new political culture with no place for corruption. Even a brief analysis of the problem of corruption in Sri Lanka will be helpful <coughs> as a starting point. The most harmful aspect of corruption is what we call political corruption. It's a, it's a new dimension that we have noticed in Sri Lanka for the past two, three decades. It is political corruption, not because politicians are its key practitioners, as well as patrons. It is political corruption because it has become the organizing principle of our democratic politics as well. It has penetrated into our institutions, <coughs> sorry, cultures, practices of electoral and representative democracy. That is the reason why every new government in our country also has the dubious reputation of being a new coalition of the corrupt. <coughs> I think the, the word that Transparency International is using is kleptocracy. There's a fascinating single word they have coined for that, uh, Chaura Tantraya. You see Prajatantraya and Chaura Tantraya. So there's a cohabitation of Chaura Tantraya and Prajatantraya. So the thing is that Chaura Tantraya has subsumed Prajatantraya. That is the challenge in Sri Lanka. The coalition of the corrupt is also a new power block, <coughs> informally organized as a secret and intangible component of the political system. You can't touch it, but you can hear about it. <coughs> it has taken control of the state and society. It is a descriptive coalition, sorry, it's a tripartite coalition of the political class, bureaucratic class, and a class, another class, which is actually the elephant in the room. <laughs> that is the big business. <coughs> It's a general perception among the people in our country that the coalition, this particular coalition, has captured at varying degrees of success the legislative, executive, law enforcement, as well as justice institutions of our country. That's the people's perception. A regime change that occurs after the election, even between elections, has now become a transfer of political power from one coalition of the corrupt to another. <coughs> the only change that can happen, as we have been witnessing so many times, is the replacement of the old names with new names of its managers. Can the Sri Lankan citizens tolerate any longer this most pernicious of the degeneration to which democracy in their country has fallen. Since last March to July this year, a host of constituencies of the Sri Lankan citizens openly and loudly proclaimed that they would no longer tolerate the regime of the corrupt that has ruined the country's economy, the systems of governance, as well as the collective life of the citizens. Then what did the new official leaders of the political class do? <laughs> Quite re recently, no sooner than getting hold of political power, true to the nature, or true to its, its nature, the political class has taken swift and 
well-coordinated action to silence that voice for fundamental reforms in our abuse-prone politics, battered democracy, and the degenerate political culture. <coughs> so there are <coughs> some fundamental difficulties to eradicate corruption. Let me briefly reflect on some of these difficulties. The lesson we have to learn from the experience we have had in Sri Lanka is that the Sri Lanka's dominant coalition of the corrupt has acquired an acute survival instinct. It is also coupled with the hard-nosed determination to crush any citizen's initiative for an ethically and normatively better political life. This conundrum, this is a conundrum of corruption actually we have to face in Sri Lanka. This conundrum of corruption is fostered by another factor. It is the ineffectiveness of the two traditional mechanisms to control corruption in Sri Lanka, namely the legal process and the media exposure. <coughs> when the legal process, particularly the process of investigation and prosecution, is either brought under the influence of the political class or rendered institutionally weak, this, its efficacy to deliver effectively punitive justice to the corrupt becomes diminished. Contemporary Sri Lankan experience offers so many examples of this trend. With regard to the media, as a tool of combating corruption, its effectiveness is largely determined by the extent to which the public exposure of corruption deters politicians and officials <coughs> against whom credible allegations are made. People belonging to both these classes have cultivated over the years a distinct disregard or even disdain for media exposure, negative public opinion or even public anger against them. We have politicians and officials who are not deterred by the conventional approach of naming and shaming the corrupt publicly in the media. Some of them have even mastered the art of turning the public shame into <laughs> political resource. <laughs> we have so many examples in our country. <coughs> it's a gainful political resource to some politicians. Meanwhile, Getting rich by the corrupt, by sorry, getting rich by corrupt and illegal means is now touted as being smart, creative, and brave <laughs> engagement in business. You know, one of those characters recently even boasted that he had private property in so many other countries also. People don't ask how do you get that private property you know, the resources. Then what can we, what can the media do in situations as a guarantor of accountability and good governance? At the Sri Lankan experience during the past three and a half decades has repeatedly shown very little indeed, unless the media also joins a broad citizens movement for combating corruption. What is the way forward? I'd like to propose a few ideas. <coughs> At least three steps. First step is to understand the gravity of the problem and the enormity of the task at hand. Two things need to be emphasized in this regard. The first is the recognition that there are three key actors in the formidable, sorry, formidable culture of corruption in Sri Lanka. The political class, the public sector bureaucracy, and the big players in the private corporate sector. The legal recognition of the private sector as a key participant in the culture of corruption in our country is a long overdue. Any new legal reform to control corruption needs to address 
this fundamental lacuna in our ap approach to the understanding of the phenomenon of public corruption. Then can, then only can any well-meaning reform movement like Transparency International committed to public good. Public good is also a Republican ideal, I must say. Committed to public good can th think of some realistic possibility of breaking the backbone of the coalition of the corrupt. The second step is to recognize and take redressive measures to end the citizen's role as a reluctant foster parents of a secret culture of corruption. And that is also a theme that has been known to everybody, but totally ignored in our discussions on public corruption in Sri Lanka. Citizens' role as foster parents of a culture of corruption. <coughs> Our overall political and administrative system is so debased that it has made most of the country's citizens hidden participants of corruption. It is indeed a form of everyday tyranny for social survival. It starts with getting children to a schools, prestigious school, or even not so prestigious school, you know, at the school going age. It is then extended to obtaining government employment. I am told by some of my students who passed out from the university, they have to spend million or several millions to get a government job, which pays about 40,000 rupees a month. And even to get welfare assistance from the government, like some of the assistance, or even 5,000 rupees, you know, that uh, the, the state assistance that people got during 2020. When can we, the citizens, start a struggle to end this tyranny of everyday corruption? I think that is also very important, the tyranny of everyday corruption, which even the poorest of our citizens are compelled to endure and participate. But the third step, <coughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, trying to recover from a cold. At the third step, I want to suggest for your consideration the following, at least four points, so five points if I have time. One, bringing the goal of ending political and other forms of corruption to the heart of the democratic reform agenda of our citizen struggles against unjust rulers. Because there is, you know, both a struggle against corruption, struggle for democracy are so closely interwoven, you know, you cannot separate them. It is a relentless struggle against political and other forms of corruption that can give a normative edge to the struggle for democracy. Don't trust the false promises made to the people during election campaigns, so sham explanation made that budget speeches. In the present historical moment, democracy provides the best, sorry, best political and ethical framework for banishing political and other forms of corruption from public life. Secondly, making the legal and institutional processes of investigating and adjudicating public complaints on corruption open and transparent. To achieve this end, making this process free of political control and subjecting the investigating and judicial processes to some degree of supervision through an independent citizen's commission would be necessary, I think, should be considered. Thirdly, resting the ownership of the language as well as the discourse of corruption-free public life by a citizen's movement from the corrupt political and economic elites who also control the political institutions and the media. That's very important. We have to get the, the political discourse against corruption, you know, for the, un, under the leadership of the citizens' movement. The new discourse should also free itself from the hollow 
hello slogans and the platitudinal language usually employed by the political class. Then only can it arouse democratic imaginations of the people for inaugurating a fresh and ethically grounded collective future for our political community. And then finally, forming a broad social and political coalition between citizens groups, trade unions, professional associations, and reform-oriented political parties is an essential social mechanism of checks and balances. I think what we need in Sri Lanka, as we learned from the experience of Aragalaya, is to strengthen our social checks and balances on the abuse of power, to prevent abuse of power. You know, the citizens' movement is one of the most creative social mechanism of checks and balances on the arbitrary exercise of political power. I think combating corruption also need to think about the utility and uselessness, usefulness of such a socially grounded mechanism of checks and balances against corruption. Finally, fighting corruption is not merely a legal matter. As many Sri Lankans appear to believe at present, legal reforms that seek to further criminalize corruption, corrupt practices and enhance the efficacy of investigative and judicial processes are necessary. However, they are not sufficient. That is the lesson we have to learn from Sri Lanka's past experience. If corruption is the bane of democracy, more democracy is the way out from corruption. It calls for making democratic governance robust through public participation, public supervision, and, account and public accountability. That's accountability to citizens with regard to the functioning of anti-corruption institutions, processes, and also the outcomes. In other words, making citizens' super supervisory participation to be integral to the systems to combat corruption will be better than the present system of no public accountability or independent apolitical public supervision. With that, uh, I conclude my brief uh, presentation with my reflections on the nature of the problem of corruption in Sri Lanka and difficulties that Sri Lanka has experienced in combating corruption effectively and perhaps, you know, a framework for thinking what can we do in the future. Thank you very much.